Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Show, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism. Hello, Dr. T. How are things down under this week? Oh, I'm fine, Craig, and we're enjoying uh, lovely weather. It's late, uh, late summer for us here, so um, we're actually enjoying the slightly cooler temperatures. That's always good to hear. I know it's warm somewhere in the world. Dr. Tony, during the July 2021 session, we were discussing a question related to how adults with Asperger's should respond to meltdowns. The actual question was, can you please do a show on meltdowns and adults and families and workplaces and marriages and relationships? And at the beginning of your response back then, you agreed that a show dedicated to meltdowns was probably in order. So today, Meltdowns is one of two subjects on which hopefully we're going to be doing deep dives. So I'm ready to get started if you are. And, and one more thing, uh, in addressing these meltdowns in adults, could you also include some age-related response, such as how might a child be assisted in teens and young adults? This way, this discussion then serves as a meltdown update for all ages of people suffering and how their loved ones can assist. Okay, thanks. What a very important question. And yes, meltdowns occur at any age. When you've got a little toddler having a meltdown, you go, oh, okay, they'll grow out of it. But when you've got an adult in a relationship that has a meltdown, and that can be at home or at work, there can be a very different attitude towards it. And I'm going to go through some explanations, but the attitudes remain the same no matter how old the person is. Now, I'm actually going to extend this because, yes, I'm going to focus on meltdowns and two types of meltdown, an explosion and an implosion. But I'm also going to focus on shutdowns and burnout. Now, a lot of these are related to stress in various forms and stress is too much and you break. It's a reaction to unbearable stress and social and sensory overload in particular, increasing anxiety and agitation. Now, the psychological response in that is going to be fight, flight or freeze. And this is a conceptualization that I'm going to explain. Now, when we go to a meltdown to begin with, it's a buildup of stress from social or sensory experiences usually over several hours, um, there's change and the unexpected, too much change, too much unexpected, uh, all my plans have gone and there's, there's chaos. It's performance expectations and judgment, uh, feeling very vulnerable, I'm not good enough and there's mistakes and confusion occurring. But another source of stress is flashbacks to various incidents that have occurred but also increasing anxiety. That is, in autism, anxiety comes in tides. And from day to day, you can have a day when anxiety is not much of an issue. But on other days, you wake up and that anxiety is really in. The tide is in. And so that anxiety will affect your quality of the day. Now, as I was saying a moment ago, there are two types of meltdown. The one is an explosion. Uh, that is the of the fight, flight or freeze. That's the fight. It's externalized. The energy is going to be released that has been suppressed or tried to be held back for quite some time. And it tends to be destructive and aggressive. It's very scary for other people. And the target is often an object or unfortunately, uh, sometimes can be a person who's thwarting that person in a particular way. It's a huge release of energy. And sometimes the energy has been building up and to release it, pop the balloon or cleanse the system is to have a meltdown. Boom. But it's what we call in psychological terms, negative reinforcement It's like Tylenol or Panadol to end a headache. Your headache is increasing. But one way of ending it, I will smash something. Oh, I feel better now. Why are you upset? you should be pleased, I'm okay. But the negative reinforcement is incredibly powerful for that individual. It's a way of cleansing the system, clearing the decks, and now I'm all right. 
I'll go through strategies in a moment. But the next one that we look at in a meltdown is not an explosion, but an implosion. The explosion is directed outwards, objects and people. The implosion is directed inwardly at the person. It's a depression attack. It's a catastrophic, deep despair, suicidal ideation. Now, the target here is the self and self-harm. In a way, it's flight. I don't want to be here. I don't want to exist anymore. My off switch for the stress and despair is to consider death, but also to engage in self-harm. So it can be an explosion or an implosion. And the depression attack is very much a, an autistic thing. I've, I've not noticed it so much in neurotypicals or others, but a very common one in autism is you internalize your despair and it's a very deep and intense, but brief. Sometimes you can't see this coming. It is very genuine for the person concerned and risky in terms of damage that may occur to the self, but then goes and the person is okay. Now, let's have a look at some strategies of what do we do for those who care and support the autistic person. Well, first of all, what we need, if we can get it, is early warning of impending meltdown, whether it's an explosion or implosion. Um, there are some signs, um, the signs and situations, but the problem in autism can be interception, that is the ability to perceive the internal stress and agitation and alexithymia to know exactly what that emotion is and to be able to convey that to other people in speech means that sometimes the last person to know they're about to lose it is the autistic person themselves. But the signals are there, the heart rate, the perspiration, all those cues are greater, but there's almost a mind-body division and the person isn't aware of the warning signals coming through. Now, sometimes you can help using sports technology, the um, sports watches that do heart rate and, and, and so on. Uh, I just had a birthday the other day and, and uh, uh, Dawn, my uh, PA and, and a few colleagues have bought me a sports watch, which I can use for the gym and so on but it's a wonderful way of checking your heart rate. So the person may notice on that sports watch that my heart rate has reached a certain level, which indicates I need to do something about it before it becomes serious. But often other people need to list the signs. So the autistic person may say uh, to their partner, parent or whatever, and for an autistic child, what you may do is parents may notice that when he talks about Tyrannosaurus Rex eating a pterodactyl, ah, oh, he's all, uh, almost about to lose it. Or there may be the pacing, the look, the lack of eye contact. And so you get on a large piece of paper, uh, a thermometer. And on the thermometer on the left-hand side are all the signs and situations change that indicate possibility of meltdown. On the other side is what to do at every stage. Okay, meltdown is, is there. It may be for a child in the supermarket because of sensory overload and crowds. It could be an adult who has been thwarted from access to their computer and computer games because the internet is down, for example. So it's very important that whoever is there stays calm and reassuring. Um, emotions in autism can be contagious. And if somebody caring for that individual is themselves scared, agitated, etc., it's only gonna make the situation worse. So stay calm and reassuring. It's a bit like when you're in the car and you've got a GPS system giving you directions and you don't <laughs> do what you're supposed to do. It tells you to turn left. It doesn't go, I just told you to turn left. What's, what's the matter with you? Aren't you listening to me? The GPS very calmly says, at the next junction, turn left. Several things, stays calm, does not comment on what you've done wrong and tells you what to do. So please remember, if you're dealing with an autistic person going into a meltdown, be like a GPS, calmly redirecting what to do. Next one. 
Please don't interrogate. What's the matter? Why are you upset? Tell me. I'll, I'll, I'll correct it. I'll, I'll help you. What, what is it? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Now, the, the problem is at this level of agitation, they haven't got the eloquence and insight and coherence to tell you what the problem is. Now, they may be able to later on when they're calm and you, you need to find out. But they are either explosion or implosion. I hate my life. I want to die. And what you're asking them to do in interrogation is to go back in time and explain what's occurring. They need to move out of it. So it's really to move on, not to go into detail of interrogation of what's upsetting you and try to fix it. Also, um, don't mention consequences. Well, you, you've broken it. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to cost, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, one of the problems is that when that person is agitated, they're not listening. Uh, so often reason will not work with someone who's temporarily unreasonable. Um, and behavior modification is based on a person making a reasonable cognitive decision. If I do that, that happens. If I do that, that happens. Therefore, mm, on reflection, I thinking of consequences, I'll do that one. It's gone. OK, I'm sorry. But reason, consequences, etc., is not going to work in this situation. Now, there's another component, which is an autistic one, which is affection. And the person is distressed. And the reaction of a neurotypical to a child or a partner is affection. But it may be perceived as restricting, confusing. So sometimes if you are going to suggest a hug, ask permission. Would a hug help? And if they say no, then you don't give a hug. So if you're going to use affection, Tell the person what you're considering, ask their permission, and make sure that the affection is at a level that they're comfortable with. One of the very important things to do is validate the feelings. You've got a point. Yep, you're upset. I can see that. Now, you may not agree with it, um, but there's no point in having an argument at this stage because what we want is recovery. So listen, non-judgmental. I can see you're very upset. Yep. That is the state you're in. I understand why you're there. You have a point, even if you don't agree with it. Please avoid intense eye contact, staring. That's very predatory, aggressive. If anything, you may look at the floor, you may look at their shoulder, etc. But staring is going to make the person worse. Now, what you do do is remind the person the intense despair will go. We don't know when. But it'll go. And when it does, we'll do something nice together. Now, also engage in minimal conversation. Um, sometimes you just need to be there. When I talk to uh, autistic individuals who have these meltdowns, they just say, I want my mum, dad or partner to just be there. Don't say anything. Just be there. Be like a sponge to soak up the despair. But don't interrogate. Don't talk. Just be there. And also, it's seeking a quiet sanctuary to calm down, somewhere where there are fewer people around, not intense light, so that the social and sensory, shall we say, uh, stressors are minimized. But also allow the person time to process the intense emotions as a solitary pursuit. They will do that, but it's going to take time. Now, sometimes you want an off switch. And sometimes the off switch is the special interest. It's not rewarding inappropriate behavior. It's the off switch. It's a thought blocker. It's a source of pleasure as an antidote to the despair. So you may suggest access to the special interest as a way of diverting their thoughts from their despair to something of pleasure and relaxation. So those are some of the strategies that I would recommend for meltdown, explosion and implosion. And this is for people of all ages, whether they're adults or whether they're children. Yes. And teachers, parents, partners, etc. A lot of it is attitude and understanding. Knowing what the person is going through, they're not getting revenge. They're not trying to, <laughs> to ruin your day. Mm -hmm. um, this is a meltdown is different from a tantrum because I can't get it and I'm going to throw a wobbly 
until I make you do that. There's a difference between a, a, a tantrum and a meltdown. It's in the eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, are the eyes consciously watching you to get what they want? As soon as they've got it, they're okay. Or is this absolute despair? The whole body language is, I've lost it. Now, the next one I want to do is is shutdown, which is is not quite so, so well known, but certainly occurs in, in autism. There's the fight, the explosion, uh, flight, depression, I want to end my life and escape from here or run away. But this is the freeze response from anxiety and agitation. Now, that shutdown can include selective mutism, where the person can't talk. They're in class and the teacher asks them a question and the whole class is looking at them and they can't speak. They literally can't speak. So sometimes the level of distress and agitation freezes the ability to respond. In animal kingdom, it's playing dead. You can't move. But there's also a condition associated with autism called extreme demand avoidance or pathological demand avoidance. And in this, what the person does is they can't acquiesce to requests or ordinary demands, anything that you may ask. Um, Could you put your shoes on, please, to a child or Can you clean your teeth before you go to bed? No, I'm not. And they are very rigid and determined to, should we say, not surrender their autonomy and self-control to acquiesce to the requests of others. It's a part of an expression of anxiety is you want control and you don't want to surrender your control in your life by agreeing to what somebody else is doing. And so when we talk to the kids who have extreme demand avoidance and autism and they're asked to put their socks on and they'll say, I, I, I can't, I can't. I, I, I know how to. I, I know I'm supposed to. I just can't. And we need to recognize that there is a mind body detachment then and they can't do it. So this is often due to problems with anxiety. So what we're looking at is for the person supporting them in that situation, parent, teacher, colleague to a certain extent, is for that person again to be gentle, calm, friendly, tone of voice. But you give choices. So if it's a child and they're going to need to maintain control, you say, okay, your choice. You can put your uh, shoes on or you can put your hat on. Your choice, which one do you want to do? Do you want to put your pyjamas on or clean your teeth? Your choice. But by giving that choice, they feel that they have the control. Now, you keep rules to a minimum because there's a risk that if there's confrontation and consequences, they're going to get more and more agitated. And you disguise your expectations in a way. You choose what to do next or um, I can't do this. Can you help me on it? Rather than say, come here and do this. So it's a subtle approach. Again, a lot of autistic behavior, challenging behavior, are adaptations to coping with anxiety. And a shutdown is one of those where the person literally can't do it. It's freeze. And there's gentle encouragement involved. Now, the final one is a new one. And it's really come from autistic adults themselves. It's burnout. And a lot of the internet chat lines, discussions and uh, work with um, clinicians is what we call burnout. And now there's now both clinical experience and research and autobiographies confirm this. Now, autistic burnout is something that has occurred not as a buildup over hours, as I've just been describing. This is over months, years or decades that's been going on. And they're burnt out in a way. Now, there's a sense of exhaustion. That person has used up huge amounts of energy in trying to cope. There's no energy left. It's like a little toy and the battery's been taken out and it won't move. There's a sense of, I can't cope. It's withdrawal. But one of the interesting things with burnout is it seems to affect executive functioning problems. 
I was talking to uh, a teacher the other day of a teenager and from the description of this teenage girl, she was going through a period of burnout. But the teacher said, I don't know why, but her executive functioning, her planning, organizing, time management, getting her act together has just totally disintegrated. And I said, yes, it's actually a sign of burnout. All your higher order cognitive functioning temporarily has gone. There's a general reduced functioning. There's also an increase in autistic traits because many autistic traits are coping mechanisms. But it's distinct from depression uh, in a variety of ways that is more exhaustion rather than self blame, pessimistic thinking and so on. It's more of a burnout of reaction to the situation. Um, and there's need for withdrawal and downtime for recovery and recovery is going to take weeks, if not months before recovery fall occurs. Um, sometimes with the cognitive overload, the executive functioning that's gone, CBT may not be recommended in this situation. This is more rest and recovery. It's the old fashioned term of you need an asylum as a way of refreshing yourself rather than intense cognitive. These thoughts are maladaptive thinking strategies and you need to bash them on the head and replace them with something else may not work. So you need to address social issues and sensory environments to reduce the stresses that lead to burnout. Now, what are the reasons for burnout? Um, one of the major ones is systematic and pervasive lack of autism awareness in the community. It's feeling isolated. It's negative experiences with healthcare and health insurance companies, education systems, employment uh, circumstances and family systems. And just feeling nobody understands me, nobody gets me. And it is a, a pervasive lack of autism awareness in that person's lifestyle. Another one is discrimination and stigma, not being accepted and discrimination at school and in the workplace. And in the workplace, if you're autistic and not good at social, no matter how good you are in the job, you may not be promoted to a level that matches your expertise because you're not part of the social club. You're not part of that inner circle that meet regularly and laugh together and social engagement. And they want part of a member of their group to get the promotion. Somebody who's not part of the group may be stuck and that autistic individual knows I'm better than everyone else. I really am. But it's not being recognized because I'm not part of the social club. Burnout can occur in teenage years, uh, adults and so on. Um, it has a cyclical nature to it in a way. Um, it's really a buildup of demands that exceed coping abilities. Now, it can also be triggered by developmental tra uh, transitions, such as graduating from high school, moving house, new job and so on, or after stressful life events, for example, the death of a pet. Now, they tend to last months or years with the recovery that is protracted and very difficult to fully achieve. The person is drained to a phenomenal degree. They are a ghost of their uh, previous self. Now, this is going to affect health and well-being, both mental health and cognitive abilities, they say executive functioning. And it's an overwhelming exhaustion, and I just have an inability to function. Um, it can also lead to uh, mutism that you can't speak and heightened sensory sensitivity, some loss of self-care skills and becoming more autistic in a way. Uh, but it's an insidious process. It's slow, but then it reaches the point of, oh dear, how are we going to reverse this? And can lead to suicidal ideation. I'm not understood. I'll never get the job that I want. I will never get a friend. And then it moves into uh, clear depression. Um, this is a quote from someone in this, experiencing burnout so severe for so long that you wish you could just not be here anymore. It's a life unlived. So 
What can occur <laughs> is that sometimes the person hasn't had a diagnosis. And when they do have a burnout and they are referred for um, psychiatric or psychological support, autism may be diagnosed for the first time. And so this can be, should we say, a cry for help. And the diagnosis allows that person to understand why, see their past through the lens of autism, know what's appropriate, explain themselves and so on. So it is helping that individual recognize their challenges, explore their life and explain themselves to other people, but also looking at support, becoming a self-advocate and also finding support in the autistic community. This is where it came from, the autistic community. And they are brilliant at providing empathy for that individual. So you may need lifestyle or career changes that uh, would help. But also masking is a leading factor for autistic burnout, of having the mask, the camouflaging, the false persona. And that can be so incredibly draining that eventually burnout will occur. Uh, so if that's the case, ask the experts. And the experts are fellow autistic individuals who said, right, stop. You need to prune your life. Get rid of those things. For those things who don't understand you, you need to explain it to them or move and create a lifestyle that has stresses that you can cope with in a variety of ways. Now, with Maya Tode, who's autistic, Danish and a psychologist, we're creating a book called Energy Accounting, which is very much on stress management. Going to be published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers, hopefully towards the end of this year. So energy accounting is looking at in your daily life, energy accounting is like a, a bank account. And you're going to have in your bank account daily withdrawals and deposits. So what drains you on your energy bank account of energy, crowds, socializing, sensory experiences, <gasps> trying to cope with my anxiety, other people's emotional states, right? Okay, dot, 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 zero to 100, what's that range? Well, socializing, zero to 100 is, is 20 to 90. Anxiety, 80 to 100, etc. So you get some ideas of that. Then what are energy deposits? being in nature, solitude, with my pets, uh, playing Minecraft or whatever it may be. Now, one of the problems is you've been spending so much energy draining with all these things, but you seem to have forgotten to include in your diary those things that energize you, give you your sense of identity, of purpose, of value. You must write in your diary and it's non-negotiable. These are the things you need to do to refresh yourself because otherwise, you're going to get burnout. out. You're either going to get depressed or you're going to be unable to do anything. This is a major psychological issue. So we need to look at what drains you of energy in your life, what infuses you with energy, probably a life not in balance. And so we balance the books as in energy accounting. So that's energy accounting later this year. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you for such a comprehensive review of meltdowns and the strategies that people can use. All right, the next deep dive. I have understood that there has been a massive development in how we look upon autism in the past decades. It would be wonderful to hear Dr. Tony give us an historic account of the development of autism research and the major events and changes in how autism is looked upon. And this great question is from Nicholas in Sweden. Ooh, okay, good one. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to say I, I can now look back and have a perspective of when I began in July 1971. And I went to Longmore Special School in Sutton Coalfield in the Midlands in the United Kingdom. And I was a volunteer at that school and met two classically autistic children, Russell and Sarah, five and seven years old. Mrs. Spicer wonderful lady, was the school principal. And she introduced me to autism. And I met two autistic children who seemed in a world of their own. Now, this was a special school. And you can tell difficulty somebody's in a wheelchair, Down syndrome is very conspicuous. But these were two kids that looked like any other kid. But the things that the other kids 
uh, enjoy socialising. They avoid it. Things that other kids would find boring, playing with water all day long, they thoroughly enjoyed. Um, but you could also see that they were very upset by certain things. So I was determined, if they're in a world of their own, to make a connection with those two and to see the world from their perspective and decided I want to become an expert in autism. I was 19 years old. Um, gradually, with both of them, as I was a volunteer at the school, I became accepted in what I call a temporary but welcome visitor to their world. <laughs> that was very important. But this was classic autism, very conspicuous, high support needs. And that's what we thought of as autism at the time. Now, I then went back to university. I just finished my first year of psychology. And I read all the journal articles on autism in a month in the library, all of them. Okay. Now, there are 7,000 journal articles a year on autism. I can't read them all. I try and read as many as I can. But there's been a huge explosion of research in this area. And we have a changing concept of autism that I've known. When I began, early 70s, it was viewed as an expression of schizophrenia. That is, if you have schizophrenia, social withdrawal in a world of your own, in an adult, okay, what must that be like in a child? Autism. And so it was viewed as child with schizophrenia or child with psychosis. And the first journal I subscribed to, what is now the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, was originally the Journal of Childhood Schizophrenia, Autism and Childhood Schizophrenia. Uh, we now know that it is not an expression of schizophrenia, fortunately. But there was also the view that it was psychogenic, that it was caused by emotional refrigerator mums. Of course, this is a very male, is it misogynist? Don't like it. mm -hmm. It's always women's fault. And, and, and you're like that because you, you, don't, you don't love your child enough. Now, my mother-in-law um, has had a, a, an autistic daughter. And when her autistic daughter was diagnosed, the psychiatrist said, your daughter is autistic because you don't love her enough, which was a terrible insult uh, in that situation. We now know it's not caused by parental rejection or lack of love. It's a gross insult, but uh, that was the view at the time. What we recognize is that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. The brain is wired differently. Um, and when I'm doing a diagnostic assessment I, uh, with a person, I don't use the term diagnosis. I use the term discovery. Today is the day we discovered your autism, like Vincent van Gogh was discovered or the Beatles were discovered. We've discovered your autism. That's what makes you different. And what is different is there's a pattern or profile and gradually over the years, it's a profile in social. It's also emotional, sensory, language, cognition, and movement. So there are six dimensions to autism. And I need to assess the challenges and abilities in each of those six dimensions. One that we have yet to explore further is movement. And I will say this that there is a signature movement pattern in autism, and we need to explore this further. Now, when I began in the 1970s, it was rare. It's one in 2,500 children, but that was profound autism. The new term, if it's going to be accepted, is profound autism. Very obvious, high support needs. At the time, often special school institutional care. Now, we've then discovered and I've been there right at the beginning, colleague Lorna Wing, Uda Frith and others in London in the 70s and 80s of realizing it's a spectrum. And what you've got is a spectrum that now moves into the normal IQ range. And the recent Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, a uh, couple of months ago, showed that Autism now occurs in one in 44 eight-year-old kids. Now, that means you're going to miss the girls and the camouflager. So it's actually going to be more common than that, but eight-year-olds. 
Um, and what we've got now is that roughly 60% of those on the spectrum have an IQ in the normal range, but a very uneven profile of abilities. So um, ASD level three or profound autism, conspicuous, we now know that there's a huge range of expressions from Nobel Prize winners to Oscar winners and all sorts of things. And talking uh, yesterday to a group of people in Wales, um, and I said that it, life would be very dull if we got rid of autism. <laughs> we, we would lose the geniuses, the artists, and many people in the caring profession. As Temple Grandin said, if we left, if the world was left to you socialites, we would still be in caves talking to each other. So most advances in science and arts are made by autistic individuals. We need them. We need to nurture them and so on. In the 19... 80s, we explored the language profile. Speech therapists would look at the pragmatics, the prosody, the pedantry, and the signature language profile, also helping those who have difficulty achieving speech, early intervention, acquiring speech. Now, when I began in classic autism, the majority never acquired speech, but now it's really only about 15, 20% of those classically autistic when they're young don't develop speech. Early diagnosis, early intervention has been great for communication skills. In the 1980s, I was there in London with Uda Frith, Simon Baron Cohen, Frankie Happy and others on theory of mind. We we're all PhD students of Uta Frith. And so theory of mind was the first exploration of the social cognition. That is the ability to read nonverbal communication, contextual cues and so on to work out what somebody's thinking, knows, feels, believes, etc. It's people reading. Now, part of the diagnostic criteria, A2, but also started to explore different trajectories. And this was Lorna Wing, wonderful lady. And what she noticed was that some of the kids that we saw two, three, four years old, no speech, world of their own, totally isolated, started to talk, started to engage socially, and moved on from Leo Kanner's silent, aloof autistic child, that they more accurately resembled Hans Asperger's description of autism. And as was the um, approach of the time, in courtesy for the first person to describe these characteristics, Hans Asperger, she used the term Asperger syndrome. What you have there is a characteristic that there is a different trajectory. So autistic kids, moved into higher ability. And those kids would go to ordinary schools. And I would visit the school because I've been involved in early intervention and I would talk to the teacher and the school principal. How's Jacob going? Oh, he's going really well. And they said, uh, uh, by the way, Tony, um, Jacob's going great, but it's Rebecca or it's James. They're just the same, but they were never as autistic when they were younger and then open the floodgates for schools identifying such kids who had always been different and often bullied and teased and all sorts of problems, but had never been classically autistic as, as younger. And they are the majority in the autism uh, spectrum. Now, uh, Lorna used the term Asperger's syndrome. And in the 1990s, I wrote Asperger's syndrome, a guide for parents and professionals which has sold so many copies and so many languages. I have great pride in that book, which has changed. It was the seminal book, really. Uta Frith wrote a book, but it was more of an academic description, analyzing Hans Asperger's descriptions and so on. Mine was the first clinician's interpretation that could be read by clinicians and parents. Uh, and that has become very valuable in understanding Asperger's syndrome now called ASD Level 1, for various reasons. Now, in the 1990s, uh, we looked at the cognitive profile, the learning profile, the unevenness, the visualizers, the verbalizers, those who have problems with processing speed and so on. So the cognitive profile, autism is a different way of thinking. And that can be an advantage to think outside the box, but there can be other issues that are going to occur, such as dyslexia and specific learning difficulties. 
we also in the 1990s started to explore the emotional profile, the high level of anxiety and depression. And in the 90s, there was a um, tide of uh, work on cognitive behavior therapy to help treat anxiety, depression, and, and so on. Also in uh, the 90s, the beginning of genetics and studying the pattern. Could there be genetic explanations to autism? Yes, but they don't explain every autistic individual. So recurrence in families, and there are families with two, three, four children on the spectrum. So that we started to recognize the genetics. Also in the 90s was the development of autobiographies, the autistic voice. Uh, Leanne holiday Willy. Uh, pretending to be normal was one of the first. She first coined the term Aspie. And it's the autobiographies which have been a wonderful way of learning what it is like to have autism and to seek advice from those with autism themselves. So what's happening today is that the expertise of autism may not simply be in clinicians and research studies, it's with autistic people themselves and it's groups, uh, autistic groups on the internet and things like that and supporting each other and giving guidance is what I call the wise elders. Now, Craig, you know that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give a quick plug for mm -hmm. our book, Been There, Done That, Try This, mm -hmm. where we deliberately asked the wise elders in autism to give advice on the challenges they face. Now, Craig, did you want to comment on that excellent book, Been There, Done That, Try This. First, I want to give credit to Anita Lesko, who is our third author that helped us coordinate this incredible group of Aspie mentors from around the world. Folks, if you haven't seen this book, it's based on the 17 most stressing, pressing issues in the life of somebody with Asperger's. And people that have Asperger's, the Aspie mentors, the seniors in the tribe of autism, wrote how they had been there had done that and how they got past the issue. So this book is somewhat timeless and uh, I guess that's as much as we can probably do to plug it, Dr. T. This is, it was by <laughs> Jessica Kingsley, uh, but it was a group effort of some of the most brilliant minds in the field of Asperger's and those were the people on the spectrum themselves. Um, mm. Gotta love them. Yeah, and it's that lived experience that is so valuable. So that was really the 1990s. Coming up now to the 2000s, we started to explore co-occurring conditions, autism plus. And, and it's rare to get autism pure. And in fact, the prognosis for those with autism pure is actually quite good. And some may become subclinical, that the autistic characteristics are incredibly subtle and may not be a significant impact in daily life as it is for others who have autism plus anxiety, depression, ADHD, learning disorders. And it's only 15% of those who have autism are um, autism pure. It's usually autism plus. And sometimes the anxiety or the depression or the ADHD has a greater impact on that person's daily life than the autism itself. So we're defining uh, learning disorders from dyslexia, uh, hyperlexia, dyscalculia, and a variety of components. Now, in the 2010 plus, uh, girls and women, uh, <laughs> I realized the girls are there, but they camouflage. It is a way of hiding your autism. It's very intelligent, but in the long term, not a wise decision. It gets you by, it gets you accepted. And people camouflage to be accepted, to get a job, to get a relationship, to stop bullying and teasing, to become part of the group. But the energy expended in a false self not only leads to energy depletion, but also despair that you're not the authentic self. So we're picking up now more and more on autistic girls and women and how they camouflage, but also how they compensate in terms of a, a career as a wildlife ranger um, in a national or park where you don't see anybody. You're there for the animals, for example. So you're finding a job where autism isn't a, a, a difficulty. In fact, you are choosing a career 
that may involve being in nature or doing things on your own as an artist, for example, and there's very little contact with other people. But also in the 2010 plus, relationships and recognition, there are couples and the issue of having a partner on the spectrum and and what may be the challenges that will exist in the relationship in terms, for example, of intimacy. And when I work in, in relationship counselling here, there are three forms of in, intimacy we, we work on. First of all is verbal intimacy to disclose your inner thoughts. And that can be very difficult for an autistic individual in self-reflection and finding it difficult to disclose their inner thoughts in um, verbal intimacy, but also in emotional intimacy of the alexithymia and so on, but also physical intimacy with issues of sensory sensitivity and all sorts of components too. So you're moving into different dimensions that are of concern and it's a new area on relationships and also on employment and recognition that autistic individuals can be very good in terms of career options, but may have problems in the social, the sensory, and so on. So a lot of work on employment. Now, a few thoughts on this. In 2013, DSM-5 came out, which perceives autism as a psychiatric condition and mental disorder. And I'm not comfortable with that. I hope it, in due course that will be reviewed, but it is. I don't see it as a psychiatric illness or mental disorder, but as a difference that needs to be understood and supported. So DSM-5 is about to have a text revision coming out in a couple of months. Hopefully they may change some of the diagnostic criteria for autism, but it is a document published by the American Psychiatric Association and um, I'm a bit unsure as to whether it should be perceived as a psychiatric condition for the future. Now, 2020s, uh, I think there's going to be a lot more research on alexithymia and in, uh, interception. There's also more screening instruments being developed for sensory sensitivity, for camouflaging, etc. And also in the last few years, autism in eating disorders, gender dysphoria, addiction and adjusting the treatment for that. But also looking at the long-term outcome of those who move out of autism. And yes, you can, it's not an eternal absence, it may be a developmental delay. And aging, another area we need to look at. Uh, what are the age, is there a, we do now recognize there is a marginally higher level of Parkinson's disease and dementia. It's not an automatic, but it's marginally higher. There may be various reasons for that. Uh, but also in aging, there can be very positive indicators in aging and autism. And for the future, we need to explore sensory sensitivity, earlier diagnosis, but also clinically acceptance of the authentic self and to explain the uh, authentic self. So a rather long description of a personal view, and it is very personal, of autism. Wow, and, and just like meltdowns, thank you for, for making it so comprehensive. Another thing I want to point out is that since the 1970s, you have been on the front lines of this. Uh, I'm pleased that you're not retiring because you will continue to be on the front lines of this, and you continue to lead us all in learning how to thrive with autism. And uh, what a career. And, and I thank you for everybody in the autism community for your work. <laughs> I go back to my 19-year-old self that made a secret wish to become an expert in autism. I've exceeded expectations. <laughs> I have done far better than I thought I would do. And it is absolutely delightful. But I've got more to discover. Mm -hmm. And there are more interesting things that are happening here. And I want to be part of it. I, I can't stop. It's been my life's... Um, goal. It, it, it is who I am. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to, I'm, I'm doing less than I used to do. Uh, it, it takes me longer to <laughs> talk of energy accounting. It takes me longer to recover after a <laughs> clinic day. I can now go and go, oh, 
where yeah. previously I was okay, I'm okay now, but I'm now going, oh. So as you age, it takes longer to recover. You do recover, it takes mm -hmm. longer. So I'm still uh, enthusiastic about autism. Mm -hmm. And I hope the rest of the world continues to feed on your enthusiasm because I know how much it's helped me personally as well. So Dr. T, I know you have to get on with your day over there. Thank you again for spending time with us and you're giving us your thoughts on these subjects. And thank you folks, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back again soon with another session of Ask Dr. Tony.